Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Today is Knockout Opioid Abuse Day in New Jersey, and I thank you for joining us for this learning series webinar, Knockout Opioid Abuse Day, an update from NIDA. We have a few housekeeping tips for today. Uh, today's webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit, one ANCC contact hour, one ACPE contact hour, one AAPA Category 1 CME credit, and one ADA CERP continuing education credit. And for any pharmacists who are claiming credit, please note that your credit will be uploaded to CPE Monitor within 30 days. This webinar has also been approved for by NJOEMS for one EMT elective CEU and by the National Commission of Health Education credentialing for one CHES or MCHES continuing education credit. So CHES or MCHES credit um, is available as well. Uh, PA planner, Dean Barone, discloses that he serves on the Speakers Bureau of Ethicon. And our faculty, Dr. Wilson Compton, discloses that he has a long-term stock equity, equity under $10,000 in CM, a 3M company, Pfizer Inc. and General Electric. So that's the end of our housekeeping for today. Um, so pleased that we can bring you this webinar today. It is jointly provided by the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey and the American Academy of CME Inc. And it is being held in collaboration with NJ Cares, the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General and the Opioid Education Foundation of America. And I thank them for their partnership and support and collaboration on today's learning activity throughout the year long learning series and particularly today on Knockout Opioid Abuse Day. Um, and I'm so pleased to welcome us today on this um, important day that launched this entire learning series, Knockout Opioid Abuse Day, from the Policy Office of New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy, uh, John Butler, and Jennifer Fearon. John and Jennifer, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much, Angela, and thank you uh, to New Jersey Cares and the Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey for hosting us for Knockout Opioid Abuse Day uh, today, and, and thanks everybody for joining uh, for today's uh, vital discussion um, in this really important area. Um, we're excited to speak for just a few minutes at the top about some of the state-level work that we've been engaged on to try to uh, address this uh, incredibly um, grave and serious problem. Uh, as Angela mentioned, my name is John Butler. I'm a senior policy advisor to the governor, uh, and I cover um, anything related to criminal justice policy, among other things, but um, uh, principally uh, focused on co-leading uh, with my, my colleague Jen, uh, our, our drug policy and harm reduction work. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jen to introduce herself as well. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm, uh, as my colleague said, I'm Jennifer Fearon. I'm the governor's policy advisor for all things health and human services, and I'm pleased to be a partner in the harm reduction and uh, an opioid response work. Uh, today, we're, we, we, we're so happy to be with you all, but we also remember those who have been lost to overdoses, um, and we appreciate you coming together to help discuss opportunities to avert the crisis. Uh, we hope to share a little bit about some of the great work that's happening in New Jersey. Um, the opioid crisis has, has really hit every corner of our state. Um, last year, nearly 3,000 people died of suspected drug-related deaths in New Jersey, and we've seen increased um, uh, racial and ethnic disparities in outcomes. Um, also in the past year, we've really seen an uptick in the uh, involvement of fentanyl adulterator associated with xylazine. Um, earlier this year, you might have seen that the White House declared Xylazine an emerging threat nationwide. And um, here in New Jersey, the Department of Health has issued a health alert to inform the, about the public health risk and about opportunities to reduce harm. Nonetheless, we have hope. Um, there's efforts across the care continuum that we're really proud of in New Jersey. Through those efforts um, in this year, there, there have been about 2,000 suspected drug-related deaths um, from January through September. Um, but also we've seen about 9,000 administrations in naloxone um, through the life-saving work of EMS law enforcement and others throughout the state. We've also seen a significant decrease um, in prescriptions dispensing opioids um, in New Jersey. And so uh, really proud of that work and turning over to my colleague to talk about some more fun stuff underway. 
Sure. Before you hear from Dr. Wilson Compton about the progress, uh, sort of the progression of the opioid crisis, we want to outline the, some of the multi-sector work underway across New Jersey here to avert opioid-related deaths and promote harm reduction. Uh, to put the state into action, uh, New Jersey has been working in every part of the continuum of care. Uh, we've been first preventing overdose and drug-related deaths, uh, expanding access to services and supports that help stabilize people with problematic drug use, uh, breaking cycles of trauma and promoting resiliency, uh, and replacing punitive responses to drug use with public health strategies and interventions. Uh, these are key examples of the really dozens of ways that state agencies are working uh, and working together, I would say, um, to save lives. Um, so and thank you to, I know there are a lot of people on this um, call and many of you have probably been involved both at the policy level and the ground level in, in helping enact um, some of these, these things. Uh, we want to just sort of tick through some of the big ones that we're um, excited about and proud of and, and um, eager to share with this audience. Uh, under uh, preventing overdose and drug-related deaths, I'd highlight uh, our expansion of harm reduction services. Um, yesterday, just yesterday, literally yesterday, uh, the New Jersey Department of Health announced that we have doubled the number of approved harm reduction centers in New Jersey uh, in just the past few months. Uh, following regula regulatory changes implemented by our administration uh, in July of 2023 to facilitate um, the expansion of these harm reduction centers, uh, the Department of Health has now began, began accepting new applications for harm reduction centers on a rolling basis. Um, we now have harm reduction centers authorized to operate in 12 of the state's 21 counties, um, though uh, through the approvals in 2023. Um, services will soon be delivered through 13 new fixed and mobile sites. Um, and to put that in perspective, before this year, there were seven. Um, so we're, we're sort of rapidly uh, expanding the number of harm reduction centers across uh, across the state. Harm reduction centers, for those um, who aren't familiar, are community-based programs that offer a safe, trauma-informed, non-stigmatizing space for people who use drugs to access naloxone, sterile syringes, and other safe use supplies. Um, they also facilitate safe disposal of used syringes and provide access or referral to wraparound services, such as substance use disorder treatment, health care, and services that address basic needs. Um, federally qualified health centers, uh, substance use treatment programs, aid service organizations, public health agencies, and other entities interested in becoming harm reduction center are encouraged to apply. Um, NJDOH has also released a, a new uh, report uh, for the past, for, I guess it's for 2020, 2021, uh, which highlights some of the many accomplishments of the state's existing um, harm reduction centers, uh, including over a thousand people seeking services each year and over 1.4 million syringes um, safely dispensed. Um, we've also focused on hot spotting. Uh, in March of 2023, in response to growing racial disparities in overdose deaths, the Department of Health also launched its Overdose Hotspot Outreach Initiative, prioritizing areas of the state with high disparities and rates of uh, and high rates of overdose among Black residents in particular. Uh, in partnership with local community organizations, uh, the Department of Health is uh, distributing naloxone, fentanyl test strip kits, uh, hygiene kits, and other material resources for individuals uh, at risk of overdose. As part of the sort of whole of government effort, um, we're also really proud to have launched this year the Naloxone 365 effort. Um, this is a first in the nation program administered through the Department of Human Services that allows anyone 14 years and older to obtain naloxone anonymously and free at participating pharmacies. Most of you know, uh, naloxone saves lives and reverses opioid overdoses. Um, and since the creation of this initiative, over tens of thousands of uh, naloxone kits have been distributed by more than 600 pharmacies around the state. Uh, we are happy to put in the chat a link uh, to our Stop Overdoses page, uh, which has a list of pharmacies that are participating. On the treatment end of the spectrum, we've really ramped up ReachNJ, which is a central call in line um, for residents who are looking for help to overcome substance use disorder. Um, each call to 1-844-REACH-NJ uh, is answered by a trained specialist 24-7 with referral to a local treatment provider or other supportive services. Um, this is regardless of ability to pay, it's anonymous, and everyone is welcome to uh, call in. Um, now, when we think more holistically, those are some of our individual initiatives. We're really proud to have uh, convened some task forces and councils over the past year to really set the path for the future. Um, 
on the one hand of the spectrum, uh, New Jersey, like jurisdictions around the country, is recipient of opioid settlement dollars, and we've convened a state-level opioid recovery and remediation advisory council uh, to make recommendations for how to prioritize and effectively use those funds, which will be about a billion dollars coming into the state over the next two decades. The membership in New Jersey reflects New Jersey's diversity. We have people with lived experience with the opioid epidemic, those who experience substance use themselves or through their families, public health and policy experts and others um, at the table to help inform those decisions. Uh, many of you may have participated in the number of listening sessions and public input, input uh, opportunities over the past year. And as we look to the next year, we're really excited um, to help uh, put those dollars to good use um, to avert this crisis. On the other hand, um, we're really thankful to those of you who might be participating in your local overdose fatality review teams. Uh, over the past year, these have been stood up so that we now have local health departments operating these in every one of our counties. Um, and our overdose fatality review teams really dig into overdose deaths and provide local and state policy recommendations to help prevent future deaths. So that we're, we're definitely taking the data to action approach to heart in New Jersey. And finally, we've been working with our, our hosts at NJ Cares uh, and the Attorney General's Office to help start to replace some of the punitive responses to drug use with public health strategies and interventions to highlight just, just two of the many things that we've been working on in that space. Um, uh, in 2018, uh, NJ Cares began administering grant funding uh, to up to 21 counties for a program called Operation Helping Hand, which is meant to give law enforcement the chance to develop and implement programs that, that focus on um, uh, substance use, a point, a point of care for substance use uh, from the law enforcement perspective. So in partnership with peer recovery specialists and doing direct outreach to individuals with substance use disorder, um, law enforcement officers and law enforcement agencies are encouraged to attempt um, uh, to connect people to care uh, at that point of interaction with uh, a law enforcement officer. Um, in this year, all 21 one of the county prosecutor's offices uh, now operate an OHH program, uh, and it's been uh, expanded to the New Jersey State Police uh, and the Division of Criminal Justice and the New Jersey Transit Police as well. Um, and the last sort of specific intervention that I'd highlight uh, uh, from the state level is uh, a relatively new program called Op for Help and Hope. Um, this was made possible in November of 22, uh, where we um, funded it with some of the opioid settlement money that we received that Jen mentioned uh, and uh, made available to six county prosecutor's offices uh, across the state to develop and launch a standardized diversion program in those municipal courts um, that will offer early intervention for uh, people who are, are uh, criminally arrested and, and facing prosecution um, uh, uh, to uh, and, and whose offenses are nonviolent to establish additional pathways to recovery outside of the criminal justice system, uh, and then ideally to have their um, you know, case disposition um, uh, uh, reflect uh, their engagement with, with services on the back end. Um, so that was launched, um, uh, I think it's launched this year uh, and will sort of be ramping up over the, the, the coming months. And on that note, uh, thanks to all for Help and Hope team, um, as well as all the sponsors of Knockout Opioid Abuse Day. We really appreciate everyone coming to join in this important conversation. Um, and we're always looking for new innovations to help improve the work in this space. Uh, so with that, thanks everyone for your partnership and looking forward to Dr. Compton's presentation. Thanks everyone for your time. Thanks, Jen, and thanks, John. Appreciate um, you being here and, um, and your comments, uh, giving us an overview on everything that we're seeing happen in New Jersey. Appreciate always Governor Murphy's leadership on this issue and the seriousness and um, prioritizing of um, you know, saving lives uh, to this disease. So uh, we appreciate um, all that is being done. Um, and thank you for your time today. Um, and now um, I am so pleased to introduce our expert panelist, Dr. Wilson Compton, the Deputy Director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, of the National Institutes of Health, who will provide an opioid overview um, for us. And thank you so much, Dr. Compton, for being with us today. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you today and to have such a terrific large audience from across the state of New Jersey. 
And as I mentioned to the organizers, well, I'm representing the federal government today and the National Institutes of Health to bring to you a research perspective on how we're addressing the overdose crisis in our country and how uh, you in New Jersey may be able to respond. This has a, a, a personal meaning to me because I'm from New Jersey originally. I grew up in Morristown. And so it's been disturbing to see how much the overdose crisis has impacted my home state. Uh, and I share with you uh, uh, an interest and really a drive to help develop the interventions and approaches that will address this public health crisis, which is affecting New Jersey, but it's not just New Jersey, it's our whole country. Thanks, Dr. Compton. And just wanted to mention to you before you get started, we also have uh, attendees from some other states who kind of messaged us here in the chat to let us know, and as far away as Canada. So. Uh, you are speaking to a, a little bit more of a diverse audience. So welcome to everyone. And now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, that's terrific. Um, I'm now gonna reframe this as an international presentation. That's, that's wonderful news. Um, you've seen the disclosures already. And something as I'm getting started, we've already seen a number of questions being posed in the chat. And so as I go through this material, please, if there's something that you've got a question about or it sparks some idea in your head, please write those ideas down and share them in the chat. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can between me and the representatives of the governor's office. We, we hope to share with you as much useful information as we can. All right, this is, these are heat maps. This looks at the estimated county level rates of drug overdose across the, about the last 20 years in our country. This is data from CDC. And uh, uh, I, I think you can appreciate two immediate things from these maps that as they get redder, that means there's higher rates of overdose in those, in those uh, uh, counties. This is what, 3000 counties around the country, including the 21 in New Jersey. And I think you immediately notice that the entire country is uh, been affected by this. So we see a darkening and a, an increase in overdose deaths in every part of the United States. But it's also really obvious that it hasn't struck every place equally. And so that's always been a challenge in drug abuse policy and drug use issues is that we think about it as being a national concern. And of course it is. But the roots of drug use problems and the roots of the impacts are at a very local level. And so we need to be thinking about community level interventions and community level approaches to address this, this what accumulates to be a national problem. Overall, the rates are extraordinary with well over 100,000 deaths reported in, in 21 and CDC estimates a slower increase, but still an increase in 22. So while it appears that we may be making some progress, it's hard to get too excited about progress when the rates of death are so extraordinary in our country. Uh, and, and I'll share with you a little bit about why we think this has been so uh, uh, su su such an increasing problem over the years. Now I've highlighted overdose deaths and I'm not gonna go into the rest of this in detail, but just a reminder that it's not just overdose deaths, but we see foster care removals increasing during the time of this overdose crisis. We see infectious diseases like in the, the, in the data on the right showing hepatitis C infections increasing in the country during this overdose crisis, reflecting the broad impacts in terms of child welfare, in terms of the social impacts of, of drug use and drug use problems and hepatitis C in terms of infectious disease from the, the sharing of infected uh, syringe equipment as a key way that infections are spread among drug users. Now you all are well aware that this crisis now involves the synthetic opioids, that is fentanyl uh, and related compounds. But it started out a number of years ago, starting in the 1990s, but really increasing in the early 2000s as being driven by, ex by egregious marketing of prescription pharmaceuticals, meaning that there were lots of pharmaceuticals available uh, uh, to be shared and that the complications, and in this case, the most serious complications of overdose deaths skyrocketed as a result. Uh, uh, as that leveled out with major push, you know, touch on this in a little while, um, uh, to address excess prescribing. We saw first an increase in heroin as the illicit marketers of opioids realized there was a huge market for their products. In this case, illegal heroin in many parts of the country that hadn't had a heroin problem before. 
And you may have seen that in New Jersey. There are certain parts of New Jersey that have had heroin for decades, but I bet you've seen heroin spreading to other parts of the state because that's been happening all across the country during the, the uh, uh, latter part of the first decade of this century and the teens. Uh, synthetic opioids have taken over in the last few years with stimulants also playing a role. So no longer is it just opioids, but it's poly drug use causing the overdose uh, uh, epidemic and overdose crisis in our country. Now I've highlighted for you the way the pharmaceutical industry played a role in with their egregious marketing practices of prescription opioids. And so I wanna propose to you that economics are important drivers of this, uh, that the, the search for profits, which is apparent in all of us, we're all driven by economic issues and economic concerns and trying to make a living. Um, but that when, when it, in, in this case, it led to very serious complications in terms of overdose deaths in many parts of the country. Um, the, addressing that have been many, many policy directives, but I wanna highlight for you an important one with the CDC guidelines in 2016, because this was right in the middle of many professional organizations, the uh, emergency departments, the uh, uh, surgery specialties working to change their prescribing practices. And CDC released their guidelines in 2016, which have had a major impact on practices around the country. But not all the time are these interventions or guidelines uh, uh, lead to positive outcomes. So one of the concerns was that with this focus on essentially the main message of don't prescribe opioids, many clinicians abruptly stopped prescribing opioids to patients who had been on them for some time, may have had a, a significant issue with physiological dependence on their opioids. And when you stop opioids, uh, suddenly what happens is patients go into withdrawal. So we followed up a couple of years after those initial guidelines when we got indications of this being a serious public health problem with additional guidance around a kind of simple message don't abruptly discontinue opioids. That's important for persons who are taking it in an illicit manner. So persons who are using opioids illicitly, we need to gradually wean them off or replace it with an opioid uh, medication uh, for their underlying addiction. And those who are using them medically need to be gradually tapered to minimize the very serious harms that are experienced during withdrawal. Most recently, CDC has updated their clinical practice guidelines, and I encourage you to take a look at that uh, as these can provide some very useful guidance uh, uh, for uh, how to consider both short-term and longer-term use of opioids. All right, so that was sort of my first foray into that early part of this current crisis, which was the prescription drug drivers of it. Uh, and while I mentioned to you that heroin also had some marketing issues that we saw heroin distributed in new parts of the country than ever before, the next major economic driver relates to fentanyl. And it's really been remarkable to see how once the drug dealers and the drug cartels figured out how to uh, uh, manufacture fentanyl on a large scale basis, it is essentially it is essentially replacing the heroin market first in the eastern part of the country and now throughout the entire US. This is really driven by the tremendous profit margin. And this is an old graphic from the esteemed newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, that highlights something like a thousand fold profit margin. So in this case, $800 worth of precursors could be uh, 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 pressed into something like $800,000 worth of pills on the, that could be sold uh, on the streets and cause tremendous damage around the country. That's a huge profit margin that can drive these egregious behaviors. Uh, and, and, and we'll come back to this at the end, but I think it really speaks to the importance of thinking about supply side issues and the understanding of the economic drivers along with our public health or health interventions. Now, of course, DEA has been uh, 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 paying attention to this and issued an alert in 2021 about the increases in counterfeit medications uh, while most of us thought, all right, the counterfeit medications would probably be painkillers. They'd be hydrocodone or oxycodone med tablets that are designed to mimic the real products that come from a pharmacy and look surprisingly similar to the real products. So they could fool people in, uh, uh, when, they're, when they're pressed into pill shape. These numbers have been extraordinary, but it's not just the prescription opioids that are mimicked. 
It also can be sedatives like alprazolam, the trade name being Xanax, or stimulants like uh, methylphenidate or the uh, uh, amphetamine salts that are that are part of the treatments for attention deficit disorder. That now people who obtain those medications from unscrupulous sources outside of a pharmacy or the regular medical channels are very likely being exposed to uh, counterfeit medications and fentanyl. It's really extraordinary how large this problem this has become. We see this reflected in the fentanyl-related overdose deaths among uh, the youngest in our population. This is 15 to 19-year-olds, uh, showing a market increase between 19 and 20, and then continuing uh, uh, higher death rates uh, related to, uh, we believe, related to exposure to the prescription medications that are counterfeit. When uh, 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 teenagers that uh, may take a pill or its intoxicating properties are unwittingly exposed to a serious poison. You've already heard mention from the governor's office, and I'm sure you all are familiar with that it's not just opioids, but the drug supply can include multiple contaminants in it. So while we may think about fentanyl as being the latest scourge on our streets, but we also have other agents added to the drug supply. In this case, we'll highlight for you xylazine. And our, our, our public health colleagues in Philadelphia are among those who really brought this to public health attention over the last couple of years. And what we've seen is this is an agent that is just a regular part of veterinary practice, and it's used as a sedative. So it is a, a sedating agent. What that means is that when it's combined with the opioid, it may prolong the intoxication with the opioid. It also adds a sedative quality to it. It does mean that when the lot, because xylazine is virtually always in combination with fentanyl, when someone is resuscitated with naloxone uh, uh, to reverse the effects of the opioid, that will still be successful. So when xylazine is suspected, the main lesson is that naloxone still should be administered, but it won't have a direct impact on the xylazine. So some of our patients may be breathing, but still quite sedated when they are uh, when naloxone is administered. And that's a little different than what many of our health officials and others have, as, have witnessed when patients often wake up abruptly when they're given naloxone. In this case, they may stay sleepy. The good news is they'll be breathing. I want that to sink in. There's a can be a, a confusing message because xylazine is not impacted by naloxone, at least not in any major way that we've we've observed. But because xylazine is almost always in combination with fentanyl and other opioids, uh, when it's suspected, administering naloxone is always indicated. Now, as you heard, the White House issued a uh, uh, a an emergency alert in July and has. Uh, 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 been developing a response plan to this xylazine crisis, both addressing what do we do clinically with persons who use xylazine and how do we understand its impact in communities. But then there's also the issue around wound care because there are these really uh, uh, difficult to treat uh, lesions in the skin that are associated with uh, uh, frequent and heavy use of xylazine. We don't completely understand these severe tissue injuries uh, but it's certainly something that uh, the practitioners and researchers are working to understand and develop better approaches to addressing. As if xylazine and the opioids weren't enough, I want to point out to you that there may be new agents added to the drug supply at any time. Nidazines are one that has not taken off the way we saw the fentanyl-related compounds, but this is another opioid that has a very different action and uh, uh, may become a, a, a concern. One of the issues around these novel agents is that uh, our routine testing, that's sort of the urine dipstick or other point of care testing, uh, doesn't routinely check for these. So it's important and it's incumbent on us that when we start seeing something that isn't responding as well clinically, or if we hear word from the street about new agents, for instance, tianeptine that I know has been an issue in parts of New Jersey, uh, that it's important we start testing decedents in terms of the uh, medical examiner evaluation of decedent uh, body fluids, as well as testing uh, patients that are seen in emergency departments and other healthcare settings for the potential exposure to these new substances. That way, that's one of the ways that we'll keep on top of these emerging threats. 
Okay, I've in rapid manner uh, over the course of just a few minutes, gone over some of the major issues related to the changing opioid crisis. I really didn't emphasize the stimulant part of this, but we can talk about that if that's important to you, that we've seen increases in deaths of stimulants as well. But we've talked about the overdose crisis. We talked about its multiple reflections. We talked about how the drug supply shifts over time, and that creates a major challenge for all of us who are uh, charged with and doing our best to respond to this crisis. The federal government has developed uh, within that Department of Health and Human Services a prevention strategy that focuses on primary prevention. What can we do to keep people from starting down this pathway to begin with? Harm reduction as a really a novel way to reduce the immediate and short-term harms related to use of these substances. Obviously, our goal will be to help people turn their lives around in the long run as well. And so that's what treatment is all about and recovery support as a major theme for our work and the projects, both from a research perspective that I may be able to support at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, as well as the interventions funded and supported by the various health and human service agencies like SAMHSA and others. When we think about early childhood uh, interventions, this is really based on the, rem on the observation that early childhood environment has a major impact on use of drugs during teen years. Drug use starts during the teens, but the predictors and the early evidence of it starts much earlier. So we see, for example, on the right, you see the ACE score. What is that? That's the adverse childhood experiences. These are abuse and neglect experienced by infants, toddlers, and preschool uh, individuals. So loss of parents, parental uh, abuse and neglect are the typical things that are, are queried uh, in terms of adverse childhood experiences. And it turns out that those that experience a number of these are much more likely to be using substances even by age 14, let alone by a little bit later in life. So having none of these adverse childhood experiences has a much lower rate than those that have multiple experiences. That's a clue that the roots of drug use start way before the first use of a substance. That actually has been the hallmark of our development of prevention interventions in our country. So I highlight for you a very interesting family-based intervention called the uh, uh, Strong African-American Families Program that was tested by colleagues in Georgia. Gene Brody and colleagues did this in rural Georgia. And it was basically a middle school parent-based educational intervention, just a few sessions in a school setting for all the parents that could get to come to their sessions. And those that participated in the SAAFT, the Strong African-Americans Family Intervention, the chil the, their children were much less likely to uh, use substances or have problems associated with substance use over the next few years. That's an example how we can equip families and the youth themselves with the tools to help them stay safe over the long haul. Now, I've been very intrigued because not only do we see improvements in terms of less drug use, but there is an indication that the strong African-American family intervention may help with healthy brain development as well. So this is a little complicated on the right, but the dotted line shows that for persons who are exposed to very severe socioeconomic deprivation during their teen years, their brain development may be quite different from those who don't experience that. With the intervention, brain development was normal in these particular regions, the amygdala part of the brain uh, that, was, that was studied by this group. Now we need to follow up on that to understand how this raising healthy children can actually improve brain health as well. Uh, but I think that's a very exciting and an important observation that even something as, as difficult as addressing childhood poverty and exposure to very high risk social environments might be ameliorated by some of these uh, family-based prevention interventions. Overall, me and some colleagues have addressed this with a, a, a publication in the American Journal of Public Health where we emphasize that targeting youth can be an important goal here. And we've seen this to address both prescription opioid misuse, as well as in this case, early childhood interventions, middle school interventions can reduce methamphetamine use years later. So it's an example of how things that can address the drug use problem in youth in general can be a major part of our interventions. All right, that's number one in our four-part 
a set of interventions. The second one that I'll go through quickly relates to the life-saving use of naloxone to reverse overdoses related to opioids. Naloxone has been available to clinicians in emergency departments for many years, and really starting in the late 90s and early 2000s, harm reduction groups in community organizations all across the country started using those vials of naloxone and distributing them to injection drug users so that they could save the lives of some of their compatriots who may have overdosed on heroin and other opioids out in the, in the communities. Building on that evidence, uh, FDA and uh, the industry uh, that is regulated by FDA were charged with developing much easier to administer formulations. So the first version uh, approved in 2014 was an auto injector available with a prescription. A year later, about a year later, FDA approved an intranasal formulation that we all take for granted today, but it hasn't been very many years. Now, I've been very excited to see that we've moved to where a prescription is no longer required uh, and we are seeing as of about a month ago that the non-prescription formulations of naloxone are now available in communities all across the country. There's a new agent. So while I think of this as a naloxone issue, I need to extend my vocabulary because nomalphine is a different opioid blocking agent that was approved in May uh, for the treatment of opioid overdoses as well. This is a prescription medication, uh, but is now added to our our armamentarium of agents to combat overdose. And finally, in addition to approving the nasal naloxone spray in March, a generic form of the naloxone spray were approved in July. So I point these out to you. I also think that as state officials, you need to be paying attention to the range of products that the community may want. So the injectable naloxone remains very popular among injection drug users. I'm not sure that I'm gonna give a syringe and a vial to, to family members or police officers or others who really aren't familiar with use of syringes. But for injection drug using groups, they're very familiar with syringes. And so uh, this is a very inexpensive product and it is preferred by some in that community. So I encourage you to pay attention to the range of products that may be useful in your uh, particular local area. Now, when we think about harm reduction, uh, the key theme here is that we shouldn't make perfection be the enemy of saving lives and making progress. There's an old slogan in 12-step called progress, not perfection. Um, and uh, uh, that's an important, I think, guideline and guidepost for all of us that because of the complexity of lives of persons with substance use disorders, we wanna make sure that we pay attention to progress at times and not require a complete turnaround every step of the way uh, and be very excited and help build on progress as we move along. Harm reduction does that in many, many ways. Uh, we've been very pleased at NIDA to support a harm reduction network, which we hope will bring new information to guide those community programs that I just heard you all mention in a number of counties across New Jersey. We're also using this a, a, a platform to start addressing an underlying issue around the stigma of addiction. Stigma can be both the way uh, systems treat people with substance use disorders, as well as there can be self-stigma. Persons with substance use disorder often feel shame and uh, extraordinary uh, burden of their own behaviors. And I think that's been one of the hallmarks of, of addiction and, and substance use disorders. This plays out in terms of people not being willing to follow through long-term with treatment and wanting to get off of treatment just as quickly as they can to kind of put it behind them. And yet because of the risk of relapse, long-term treatment is in order for this case, in this case. Now this brings me to the, the third part of our, our, our paradigm, which would be the importance of medications for opioid use disorder. And I really love the title of this a publication from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, the uh, consensus study report from a few years ago that was simply highlighted with the bottom line message, medications for opioid use disorder save lives. The issue is that many people who have these conditions do not uh, avail themselves of the treatment that they could benefit from. So that's been a major push for us. Now, I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit and focus, you know, what's been happening just in the most recent 
time period during the COVID pandemic. And this is a complicated slide, but you can take it apart and understand it, I hope, fairly quickly. In red and purple are the uh, uh, different six month time periods during the COVID pandemic. The blue are prior to it. And these are the rates of overdose deaths for uh, those older, those are the top two bars, for those, I'm sorry, younger on the top two bars, older on the bottom two, men on the left, women on the right. And we also see uh, overall rates as well as the different racial and ethnic groups in our country. What can you appreciate? I think this is very much like those county level rates. On the one hand, one message is every group sees an increase. We saw a market increase in overdose deaths during the pandemic, but you do see that they are disproportionate and particularly large increases for black persons and American Indian Alaska Natives show high rates throughout this entire period. So it's a reminder that there are health disparities even while the entire country is affected there are groups and places where we need to put in a special effort. Now, during the COVID pandemic, we saw major changes in policies. We saw the uh, 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 methadone being allowed to be uh, 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 given to persons for larger number of take-home dosages. We saw buprenorphine being available to be prescribed without even seeing a patient in person. That's a pretty radical change for healthcare practitioners to use telemedicine to initiate care of somebody with a very serious health condition. Of course, we'd prefer to have a physical exam and a full in-person evaluation, but this potentially opens up treatment to a large number of people who otherwise might not be able to get care. Now, the question is, were there harms from that? Did we see increases in overdose deaths? In uh, one set of studies, uh, we've seen no increases in overdose deaths related to buprenorphine. Uh, during this time period. So that is a strong indicator that the major changes in availability didn't have an impact on at least the most serious consequences related to opioid exposure. The take-home methadone dosages were actually associated with improved outcomes. So we saw lower rates of discontinuation, lower rates of interruption therapy, and lower rates of overdose in those that had higher number of take-home dosages. So to, my, to me, this is a, a very positive indicator. Uh, colleagues uh, that I had the pleasure of working with have been looking at Medicare populations, and we documented that actually use of telehealth services was so associated with retention in care, with less likelihood of having a non-fatal overdose. And then when we were able to link the Medicare data with the fatal overdose death data, we were able to document that telehealth was associated with less uh, uh, overdose deaths as well. So these are indicators that these policy changes during the pandemic might have been very helpful. NIDA research has of course been shifting to address the overdose crisis related to fentanyl, related to poly substance use. The prevention issues are a major theme. We're just launching a new study with the National Academies of Medicine on how to implement prevention more effectively. Because one of the issues is we have a lot of data about early childhood prevention interventions, but we really don't have widespread implementation and uh, we don't have a strong prevention workforce infrastructure or financing system to implement these broadly. We're not sure how to solve this or we wouldn't be asking the experts at the National Academies to come up with a blueprint for how to solve these issues. But I'm hopeful that this new study will give us some guidelines and some support for how SAMHSA, how NIDA, how your state officials and others can uh, help promote prevention as a key part of the overdose crisis and other aspects of addiction prevention. We've been focusing at NIDA and the National Institutes of Health on uh, how to address the criminal justice involvement in our drug use crisis. As a country, we've used criminal justice policies as our major approach to addressing drug use among the population. And that has not been successful over the last 40 years. So what can we do that will be smarter to address these issues? How can we incorporate treatment and naloxone distribution as just two uh, uh, ways to address this issue effectively among the large number of persons who are affected by addiction and particularly opioid use disorder in the criminal justice system? We've been focusing on broad community interventions and uh, developing better interventions through our clinical trials network uh, as some of the ways that we're trying to develop as fast as we can new approaches that you and your communities can implement. 
For instance, I'll highlight for you that we were very excited to see some positive evidence for an intervention that's a combination of bupropion and naltrexone to improve the outcomes for persons with methamphetamine use disorder. I don't have medications for methamphetamine use disorder that I can recommend. And even this combination, it's premature to recommend it. But we saw a positive signal from these, this important study that was released uh, now about uh, two years ago. And uh, we're trying to build on that to develop further evidence to see if this combination might, might really be proven to be useful or if other approaches to addressing uh, methamphetamine use and other parts of addiction might be useful. We're working on some very novel approaches too, things like magnetic stimulation. So that's using magnetic coils to change the circuits in our brain in positive ways. These are established approaches when it comes to the treatment of depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, and some other psychiatric conditions. Well, might they be used to strengthen the decision-making that's impaired in persons with a substance use disorder? There's at least preliminary evidence that that could be useful. And so there are a number of groups trying to develop these techniques right now. Vaccines are another novel approach. The goal here would be to use antibodies, these are large proteins, to latch onto the drug of abuse and keep it out of our brain. What it means is when an antibody attaches to cocaine, to methamphetamine or fentanyl, it would keep it in the circulation and out of the brain. So you wouldn't have the intoxication that drug users are seeking. So maybe their behavior will change as a result. And also you wouldn't ha have the uh, overdose risk because it wouldn't hit the respiratory centers of our brain. This is a, a, a strong theory that we are in the process of testing vigorously with uh, uh, rigorous research. I'm just gonna end with what I hope is a hopeful message that recovery is not only possible, but I think that is, should be the expectation for persons with substance use disorder. And our communities can be organized to support recovery in meaningful and important ways. Uh, this is an, an, a, a, an important area of both research and practice development uh, that is one where we're seeing health outreach workers, we're seeing recovery support workers working in emergency rooms. We're seeing some very interesting work on outreach to identify people who may have relapsed early. So instead of waiting for them to completely bottom out and maybe have serious devastation in their lives, bring them back into treatment to help them turn their lives around earlier than they might otherwise have done so. Those are some of the promising techniques that build on recovery principles and recovery approaches. Okay, I'm pretty well done. I'm gonna focus on just a reminder of sort of the key messages that the evolution of the opioid and overdose crisis has really been extraordinary. And I think that's a reminder that it's not a passive world out there, but we have drug dealers and drug cartels and other manufacturers coming up with novel ways to sell their addictive products to the community. We need to be smarter and work faster and be able to get ahead of uh, the changes that we see. The COVID pandemic has exacerbated the overdose crisis, but it's also given us some new tools in terms of treatment, that I think is very interesting. Treatment addressing the underlying neurobiology uh, is essential to save lives and paying attention to the fact that these can be chronic relapsing conditions. So how are we implementing treatment in the long run? Of course, I'm focused on new tools and new approaches. That's my job at the National Institutes of Health is to come up with better ways to address these concerns. I'm very pleased we have effective treatments, but they're not perfectly effective. And we need to come up with better ways to address these serious issues to save lives and help people turn their lives around. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna stop sharing and I, I think we have time for some questions. Thanks very much. We do. And thank you so much um, for that really comprehensive um, presentation and overview. Um, appreciate all the information that you shared. I know we have um, a number of questions. I'll just start uh, before I go to you and just let everybody know that, yes, a copy of the slides will be made available to you um, after, uh, as well as a recording of this presentation um, for you to review. Um, so just wanted to get that out of the way. But uh, Dr. Compton, uh, there were some questions. Um, you talked about um, the opioid crisis and the origins of it. And, and the question was, how can alternatives such as chiropractic care or acupuncture be used as part of a strategy to reduce the opioid crisis? Um, and how long 
if someone opts for an opioid, are we seeing dependency? So that's kind of a combination of a few questions that came in. Those are both terrific questions. Of course, one of our main goals is to develop better treatments for pain as a way of preventing the exposure to opioids, which can be one of the main starting points down this pathway to a substance use disorder and full-blown addiction. So what can we do to address that? There's been a major emphasis on that goal at a federal level. Congress has been very generous with funding to allow us to increase our focus on pain research at the National Institutes of Health, as well as increasing funding for addiction and overdose uh, interventions. I'll highlight for you one example. Um, we worked, my, my, my team among others, with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Previously, Medicare did not approve acupuncture for the treatment of pain conditions. Uh, and uh, uh, based on an evaluation of the evidence, uh, now uh, several years ago, but a couple of years ago, they were able to approve acupuncture as a reimbursable uh, 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 activity uh, for the treatment of low back pain. Now it is limited to that indication and we're not sure and we need to make sure that there's strong evidence in other cases. But that's an example of how uh, we can use evidence to help drive policy changes to make these treatments more available in real world settings. I think that's a wonderful example, but we need to do a better job and I could highlight for you some other promising approaches, but I, I think that's enough as a principle. <laughs> All right, the thanks. Sec the second question related to how quickly do people become addicted to these substances or dependent. I want to reflect back for you the difference between dependence and addiction. Physiological dependence means that when you stop a sub substance suddenly, you'll experience withdrawal, or you may need a more of a substance to get the effects you're looking for. So for example, persons that take medications for their blood pressure, particularly beta blockers. Your physician, I hope, has warned you, do not stop those suddenly. And if it looks like you're going to run out, make sure you get a refill. Because when you stop that medication suddenly, you not only have the revert back to your regular blood pressure, but you may have rebound. You also may have some of the symptoms of withdrawal with heart rates, palpitations, and other uh, symptoms that are really because your body got adjusted to that medication. And if you're going to stop it, you need to do it gradually over time. In the exposure to pain medications, even a handful of dosages can lead to people becoming tolerant, meaning, huh, that 15 milligrams isn't doing as much. I need 30 now. That is seen after just a few dosages. It's also possible that generally mild but there can be discomfort if they're stopped abruptly, even after, after just a few doses. Now, that suggests that at least patients need to be warned about that so they don't think there's something going wrong when they get jittery, uneasy, may have goosebumps or an upset stomach uh, uh, when these medications are stopped, even after medical procedures or after use in a hospital just for a few days. I also think that's an important uh, uh, learning experience for physicians. That's not the same as addiction. Addiction is organizing your life around the substance. It's using it even though it's causing you problems. It's spending more time than you can afford. That's different. It can include withdrawal symptoms and use to avoid withdrawal, but it's much more than that. And it's a broader behavioral condition. And I think it's important to keep those in mind. And it's one of the reasons why I like the label substance use disorder uh, or addiction rather than dependence, because dependence is a kind of a normal physiological response to these uh, these substances. All right, thanks for uh, for giving us that history and clarifying that. Um, we have a number of um, community um, workers on with us. We have the faith-based community. How can they um, get involved? That is one of the questions. And, and if they do have naloxone on site, is it harmful to administer it to someone who um, may not be suffering from uh, an opioid overdose? Well, the reason that the FDA was able to approve naloxone as an over-the-counter non-prescription medication um, is because it has very few complications or side effects. Um, it, is, it is, I mean, if you have an allergy to it, it might be contraindicated, that's rare, um, but it rarely produces any problem. Now, physicians always use word by like rare and unusual. It means that it's safe to administer if you have, if somebody's unconscious and comes to an emergency room, it's administered immediately. 
regardless of what you think the underlying cause is, because it's it, it doesn't cause complications with other treatments. And in case their overdose is part of it, it's a life-saving intervention only if it's administered quickly. How, how fast does harm to our brains take place when somebody stops breathing? This is a question for you all, but I think you can imagine. How long can you hold your breath before you pass out? Um, uh, it's a matter of just several minutes before irreversible brain damage occurs. You know, whether that's four or five minutes, I'm not sure, but it's in somewhere in that range. So we really don't have long to help restart breathing. And that's why administering naloxone is such an important part of, of saving lives. Thanks. And can you speak a little bit about the poly substance use that um, you are seeing or we are seeing? Um, and since it's so common, um, any recommendations for clinicians giving MAT, what they should check for, what they should know about? Well, I think it's important but, but for, for several reasons. When, when we start taking care of persons with substance use disorders, we realize that it's not sort of a simple one-size-fits-all situation. Most of the patients that I've taken care of in my career didn't just use one substance. So even if opioids were their primary problem, they often drank too much, they often smoked cigarettes, they often used cannabis, they often used stimulants. Um, maybe the opioids were their main problem and that was our primary clinical focus. But if we didn't pay attention to how the other substances were impacting their lives, we re really weren't providing full clinical care. So uh, asking about it, testing for it in terms of biological specimen testing periodically is essential as well. Now, I, I can't do a full addiction medicine lecture in two or three minutes, but that's a, that's a short version. I will say that we saw some evidence, I heard about this mostly in Ohio, where there were a number of drug users shifting from opioids to methamphetamine going, well, I know opioids are so dangerous, I'm gonna shift to methamphetamine. To a certain extent, that's been a little bit of the proverbial jumping out of the frying pan and landing in the fire, because methamphetamine alone can produce uh, uh, arrhythmias, uh, uh, and death through uh, mostly cardiovascular uh, uh, complications, but it can produce death just like opioids can, just a different way of doing it. Thanks. And I know we're coming to the end of our time. I wanted to give you one last um, moment um, to leave us with, um, you know, a, a comment. That, uh... Well, I think I was very pleased to hear John and Jennifer describe what your state policies are and how you're approaching this, because it's only by working together. It's, you know, we're going to have some resources coming from the federal government. Many of them are channeled through the states. Some of them come directly to universities and other local groups. But it's only by working together with federal partners, state partners, and local partners that we're going to get ahead of this uh, really devastating crisis. Now, I'm, I'm a generally optimistic person. Um, but I have also been discouraged by some of the increasing rates of deaths we've seen in this. And so it reminds me that we all need to work together and come up with new, new approaches. So I'm curious about what works for you all and can you all spread that to other locations? So it's not, no, not just New Jersey, but Pennsylvania, Delaware, even New York, as well as Canada that might benefit from what you're learning and seeing that works in your communities. No, thanks so much. And, and as I think um, you talked about like the spectrum, looking at prevention and uh, education all the way to um, recovery support and uh, having that hope for that and, and all of the policies and all the work that so many of our attendees are doing um, out in their communities, um, particularly today as we as we acknowledge that, you know, this day of kind of awareness and education um, and helping to reduce stigma surrounding this issue. So um, I think your comments, uh, you know, are really well placed with, with all of our attendees. So thank you so much, Dr. Compton. We appreciate you being with us today. Appreciate all the information um, that you shared, uh, Jen and John. We appreciate um, you and the support of the governor's office with being with us today as well. I know that the um, poll has launched and I know there's information on your screen on how to um, access uh, continuing education credits or CMEs. So please take a look at that. Again, Dr. Compton, thank you for being with us. Again, all of our attendees, thank you for being with us. I hope today uh, as we commemorate Knockout Opioid Abuse Day, 
you'll take a moment to share a message, share a recording of this presentation uh, to get that word out, particularly right with people across the state as, or uh, across the country, as Dr. Compton uh, mentioned, getting that word out about what we're doing here uh, in New Jersey. Um, there's information in the chat on a link to resources that you can share. If you can email something, post a message on social media today, um, you know, we can help get some messages out and help reduce stigma. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thanks for being with us and um, have a great day. Be well, everyone.